Welcome to the European Student Think Tank's uh, webinar by the Youth Employment Group on Brexit and its effect on youth employment, uh, both in the United Kingdom and for those seeking employment within the United Kingdom. Uh, for context, we'll do a round of introductions first before leaping into the webinar. Um, Achilles, would you like to start? Absolutely. My name is Achilles. I'm from Greece. I'm 21 years old and I'm a bachelor's student in my last year in University of Gross in International and European Studies. It's a pleasure to be here. Esther, you're next. Hey, yeah. Um, my name is Casper. I uh, recently graduated uh, from uh, my liberal arts and science uh, degree in, uh, in the Netherlands, and I currently have a gap year in which uh, I'm learning French and uh, being a part of this uh, working group. So, uh, yeah. Hey, yeah. My name's Gina. I'm a PhD researcher at Cardiff University, working on youth entrepreneurship, and I'm also a self-employed youth entrepreneurship workshop facilitator and researcher. Great. My name is Tiffen. Um, I'm a PhD student in history at Cambridge, um, and I am the team lead for this year uh, for the Youth Employment Working Group. Next up, I think, is Tomas. Hi, my name is Tomas. Uh, I'm a Spanish, and I'm research assistant at SIPS. Uh, a Brussels-based think tank. And finally, it's Sophia. Hi, I'm Sophia, and I'm a final year undergrad student of social policy at the University of Bristol. So in terms of how we'll run the webinar, basically we will start off with an introduction, a little bit on what Brexit is, and a bit on sort of different experiences that people that we've come across have had with Brexit. We will then follow on by a segment led by Gina, on the school to work transition within the UK and how that has been affected by Brexit. And finally, we'll end with a segment led by Tomas on young people um, as vulnerable workers and uh, the UK's labour force. Uh, so Brexit is the popular name for the process that the UK has undertaken by leaving the European Union on the 31st of January, 2020. Uh, the UK had been a part of the EU since the 1st of January, 1973. A referendum after a long period of Euroscepticism in the UK was proposed by David Cameron, who was then Prime Minister and head of the Conservative Party. Uh, the date was set on the 23rd of June 2016. And as a result, 51.89% of voters voted in favour of leaving the European Union, uh, therefore called the Leave vote, and 48.11% voted in favour of remaining a member of the EU. Uh, key points of contention during this debate uh, included immigration, sort of labour, especially concerning sort of fishing as an industry, uh, however, all of that aside, we will be focusing primarily on how it's affected young people, many of whom might not have had a say in the vote and have actually included, has sort of joined the, the workforce recently. Uh, before we kick off the webinar in full, uh, we sent out uh, a question to a few of the people who follow the European Student Think Tank, asking them how Brexit affected their educational and employment prospects. Uh, Achilles, I think you have the first testimonial. Absolutely, and it is a testimonial by Leah, who is saying the following. As someone from Northern Ireland who can hold both British and Irish citizenship, I have found myself in a position where I have to consider which citizenship to use for different opportunities, which, on a socio-legal perspective, means the very purpose of the peace agreement here enabling dual citizenship is undermined, as there is a de facto hierarchy of rights, etc., arising from which citizenship you're holding. On a practical basis, she says that she has found herself considering whether she should apply for certain internships, academic opportunities, etc., based within the European Union, as the process has become more complicated. Now, I make two important things out of uh, Leah's comment. The first one has to do a lot with what we call, for example, in uh, the what we call in the common market, the equivalent measures with equivalent effect. So I think this kind of applies here as well. We see that we have a legal agreement which is negotiated on a high level. And this, what we're seeing here, the issue with dual citizenship 
it is pretty much discrimination and a discrimination that is coming as a side effect, something that we have not accounted for. And the fact that you're given different opportunities, but you don't always get to choose your passport, your citizenship, can become a very important issue, especially from under the scope of uh, human rights. So we are seeing here how this can influence educational prospects, employment prospects, but obviously prospects for prosperity overall. And then the second comment has to do with the fact that Again, we're saying that individuals are forgotten. The fact that uh, the negotiations were made in such a politicized environment meant that they originally took a very bureaucratic turn in aspects in order to dissociate from the politicization. And this is Leah's comment is proof that there is the end result for the citizens has just been confusion. Brilliant. Gina, I believe that you have another testimonial for us. So this is from Lara B. I moved to Berlin to finish my master's in October 2021. I had to get a visa from the German embassy in London, then a student residency permit when I got to Berlin, then an extension, then a job seeking visa. And now I have to get a job that fulfills the very strict requirement of the next residency permit. This is not an issue that my classmates with EU passports have to deal with. I'm tired and fed up of dealing with the consequences of a decision being made by a public that was lied to and uninformed. I think this is a really interesting comment because it's not just the bureaucracy of having to apply for all these different visas, but it's also the cost component. For many young people who may not have kind of the socioeconomic privilege to be able to pay out for all these visas, that completely halts any chance at working in the EU. Whereas before Brexit, there was something that young people could go and do that. Additionally, it's kind of the point that Many people were lied to. There was a huge campaign of misinformation around Brexit, and many of the young people dealing with the consequences of Brexit didn't get the chance to vote. They didn't get a chance to decide on their future. That was chosen for them by a population that there's some very interesting stuff about kind of what information was being sold at the time and who it was being sold by. Um, so that's kind of why I find the comment very fascinating and frustrating for young British people that just want to improve their life. Fantastic. I think um, we've seen sort of two results of this. On the one hand, sort of frustration uh, for a lot of young British people and then for people who might be dual nationals or who might be looking to kind of come to the UK. There's a lot of confusion, as Achilles has underlined. Um, a few other testimonials that we had also unpicked uh, the high levels of cost for EU nationals looking to study in the UK. The fact they might not therefore choose to go to, say, a prestigious UK university if they had an offer from there because actually suddenly it was too expensive. Um, we also had a few testimonials from people, uh, from one individual who uh, was more interested in medicine, for instance, who mentions that uh, a lot of Greek doctors and Greek sort of young medical professionals do have a great knowledge of English, but would no longer come to the UK despite the chronic, un un the chronic understaffing of the NHS due to high fees, etc. Moving on from this, therefore, um, we can see that there's a big question on freedom of movement, and this will be unpicked further in Gina's upcoming segment on the school to work transition. I'm going to briefly introduce kind of what the school to work transition is. The school to work transition is that kind of part of a young person's life where they are finishing formal education and finding work. It's typically considered the point at which a young person becomes an adult. So historically, if you look back to our parents, many of the times they would have left school at 16, got a full-time job and stayed in that company for a very long time. Usually got married quite young, usually settled down quite young. With kind of the changing nature of the labour market these days, it's much more unstable. Young people are staying in education much longer as well. What we think about as a school to work transition has completely changed. It's become much more fragmented. Young people are staying in education longer, but they're also working alongside that. So at what point do you become an adult? Additionally, many of the young people are now engaged in unstable work. So gig economy work, zero hours work, short term contracts, because that's what there is available at the entry level. Um, particularly what I wanted to look at is actually mobility with students and um, particularly with like the Erasmus funding, what other components there are now. So what does that mean for young people? Particularly, what does that mean for young people from working class backgrounds, socioeconomically disadvantaged to young people in the UK? So let me ask you, Gina, when young people think of the European Union, many times the first thing that they think of is Erasmus funded st study exchanges abroad, or perhaps even training programs under Erasmus Plus. So given Brexit, could you give us perhaps some background on how the relationship has been 
uh, with the EU and the Erasmus program? How have things changed throughout and post the Brexit environment? Yeah, so Erasmus was originally launched in 1987. It was this fantastic international exchange program for students. Um, in the last 30 years, about 9 million young people across Europe have been able to have these really amazing international exchanges. So to study, train or volunteer and to gain a lot of professional experience. In 2014, you had then had kind of the introduction of Erasmus Plus, which offered further opportunities to higher education and vocational education and training. So I come from a background, I used to work as an Erasmus Plus project manager at an NGO in London. So we not only sent students abroad, um, you also had kind of young people that were perhaps not in education um, or training. So neat young people who were able to participate in these short term exchange projects. So it was really good for young people that perhaps weren't enrolled in higher education or quite disengaged to be able to have these international mobility opportunities. Um, then obviously we did have the Brexit vote. Part of Brexit, there was these really big drawn out negotiations on the Erasmus programme, whether the, the UK was going to stay a part of it. So initially Boris um, Johnson announced that Erasmus would be safe. And in typical uh, style, weeks later announced it was going to be, we were leaving Erasmus and we we're going to replace it with the Turing programme. Um, so under the Turing programme, this is something that applies to all the UK countries, but under the UK, there are differences in the impact of this. So Northern Ireland can still participate in Erasmus Plus as well, due to an agreement with the Irish government. Wales, really interestingly, has set up its own scheme, which is the TIFE scheme. So this still invol involves like the reciprocal international exchange that Erasmus had. And I think it committed about £65 million to the scheme, as well as also participating in touring. Scotland's currently in the process of setting up its own scheme. Um, it's received a bit of criticism for the delays in this, but it looks like it's going to run something similar to TIFE in Wales. Whereas for England, um, there's just the tiring scheme at the moment, it seems. So, yeah, thanks for that uh, little overview. So you've mentioned the Turing scheme a couple a uh, couple times now. Could you dive a little bit deeper in what it exactly entails and where it gets its name from? It might be obvious, but it would be good to, to know. That's fine. Um, so the Turing scheme was launched in March 2021. It was named after Alan Turing. For anybody that doesn't know who he is, he was a World War II codebreaker at Bletchley Park and he was from Manchester. Um, and yeah, so interestingly, he was persecuted at the end of his life for being a homosexual. He was convicted in 1952 of what was called at the time gross indecency and can be castrated. And it's only actually in 2013 that he was pardoned for this. So it's been very interesting that the scheme has been named after this gentleman. Um, so this, the UK government set up the scheme, it was considered to be a global mobility program for students at a variety of institutions. So predominantly universities, schools and colleges. Um, it isn't set up for reciprocal agreements, unlike Erasmus. Um, so there isn't an exchange component, it is just an outward mobility program for British young people. The remit of this scheme is further than the European Union, so young people can go pretty much anywhere in the world as part of this UK global commitment. Um, and the funding for it comes in three levels, depending on the cost of living in each country. So if you were going to Sweden, you would get a very different amount compared to if you were going to Italy, for example. Um, so a big issue that we have in higher education is that campuses are missing out on that exchange. So we've got lots of young people that are leaving, but not many young people, European young people that are coming in as international exchanges. Um, Particularly, I know some of the comments that we have from young people, the opportunity for EU students to study short term in the UK is highly diminished. Um, so there are some individual agreements that universities have with partner organisations to have these short term exchanges, but it's very much dependent upon the institution. Um, it's not a universal thing in the UK. Yeah, so you you already mentioned it's uh, the term program is more in a, an outbound program. So. Uh, how do, how has it changed, particularly for EU uh, exchange students, sort of looking to to go to the UK? Is that uh, is that still within the options within the Erasmus program, or has that uh, been cut out? It's cut out completely. It seems, as we've seen from testimonies from young people, that it's now expensive for many EU young people to come and study even short term in the UK, unless you are at one of the organisations, so the universities that do have these agreements, and that's usually where one university per country um so it's very kind of short term it's a case by case basis the funding for them is typically quite less as well and it's very dependent upon kind of different things it's not erasmus where i was much more upset all right and and being that the the exchange part um so to say is kind of taking taken out of the the equation within the 
context of the turn scheme uh, are individual universities uh, attempting to to still di- have this diversity through sort of individual exchange programs to sort of attract these international students to their campuses through sort of yeah sh- schemes or programs that they then only apply to their own university yeah so individual universities can set up exchange agreements and they offer internal funding for this um, and different governments so i spoke earlier about the welsh government having a type scheme they still have the international exchange component between Wales and other countries. But in England, it really is based on the university. Um, and obviously with Scotland, we don't know what's going on yet, but it looks like they may have a similar to Wales. But for England and English universities, it's typically on a case-by-case basis. And from what I've seen, it's typically the wealthier universities, so those within the Russell Group that do have these agreements. Uh, smaller universities are much less funded. And they're likely to be able to have the capacity to do this scheme. So it's also an issue of socioeconomic ability for many young people, is if they can do that. You know, now let me guide the conversation a little bit towards a comparison between the programs. Considering the fact that the breakup between the EU and the UK wasn't really the smoothest, uh, do you believe that the current regime that was achieved was the best possible outcome? Would you say that it provides the same accessibility for young people? Um, so Erasmus is not only offered international exchange, so I think we're talking about it, a lot of this is on a student, university student level, but it also offer, offered international exchange and training programs for those meet, so not engaged in education, employment and training. And these are fully funded, so there's this really good component of social accountability for those that aren't engaged in higher education, which for many in the UK is privileged to be able to go to university. Um, so as part of Erasmus, the fundamental aim was to promote accessible study, work and training across the 37 countries. Um, when I was working in London in the NGO, we did send a lot of marginalised young people from very kind of low income backgrounds overseas for short term projects. Um, their accommodation, their living costs were pretty much covered and it gave them the opportunity to explore like these new sectors, these new places. I always thought kind of Erasmus, I always felt very fondly about Erasmus because of the opportunities it gave so many people, including myself. I got to go on these projects and it's not something I could have afforded without that support. Um, and for many of the young people that we sent, it was their first time going overseas and it kickstarted for a lot of them moving to the EU for work purposes. It wouldn't be the case now. Uh, but for others, it also provided them with like some of the skills they needed to keep in the UK to work here. Um, so I speak particularly from the perspective of young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, so working class young people. Erasmus training projects were one of the only opportunities they had for international abilities. Um, Additionally, Erasmus did offer additional funding for those disadvantaged backgrounds. So you had kind of your base level grant, and if you qualified for um, as a disadvantaged background with the kind of uh, criteria that they had, you got additional funding. Similarly to that, you also had it for disabilities. For accessibility purposes, there was additional funding in the pot for this. Um, in terms of touring scheme at the moment, from what I've seen, they do have additional funding, similar to Erasmus, um, but it's not much from what I've seen. So if you're going to high cost country, so if we think of example, Sweden, um, if you're from a disadvantaged background, you get approximately 25 pounds a week more. However, that still only equates to about 160 pounds a week. Um, in Sweden, I don't think that'll get you very far. I visited for a day and probably spent that much. Um, additionally, for the, the touring participants, rather than where Erasmus was a constant blow, with touring, you have to apply yearly. So the number of students and organized like a university can send varies every year. And I know a lot of the criticisms that I've seen from kind of academics working to send young people, you find out very last minute if you're going. So in terms of actually getting visas, so if you've got a placement over the 90 day threshold, um, you need a visa, there's not much time to do this. So touring it seems much more disorganized at the moment, whilst it looks great in terms of the amount of money they're com- committing to it. In terms of the actual process of doing it, it seems so disorganized. And um, from the UK government perspective, they've kind of said, so far with touring, an estimated 38,000 students are set to go abroad, with about 20,000 of them coming from this disadvantaged background. So it looks like there's a really high uptake, um, but they're very short term, a lot of these projects. You can go from as short as two, two weeks. Erasmus was usually much longer. So I would probably imagine that many of these placements are on the short side of things due to cost um, rather than it being the long-term exchange that Erasmus was. So it may have some benefits, but I do think that Erasmus was the better option 
Um, and so you already mentioned some uh, some numbers earlier, but could you talk a bit uh, more about the, the concrete numbers on reimbursements that are available to students uh, under the Turing scheme? That's what I mentioned beforehand. So for like a high income country, but a low income student, it's about £160 per week. So somewhere like Sweden, Canada, the US, um, which as we can imagine, particularly in the cost of living crisis, isn't covering much. And that's again, £25 more than someone who isn't from a disadvantaged background would get. And kind of the threshold for what disadvantaged is, I've not been able to find on that. So it could be very small, it could, we don't know, but it just doesn't really. look like for someone to be able to go. Mm, okay, yeah, that's uh, that's clear. I guess we're uh, going to have to see how it will uh, the go the upcoming uh, year. So uh, how has the Durham program generally been received by uh, by UK students or rather the the change from the Erasmus program to the to the Turing program? I think Erasmus Plus, from my experience, was always seen as quite a middle-class student thing. Um, and the Turing scheme, in terms of the marketing of it from the get-go, has been set to replace it and make it more appealing to those from wider backgrounds. Um, and particularly looking at the data with the really positive uptake with those from disadvantaged backgrounds, it looks like the like receipt of it so far has been quite good. But it's only the first year. You're literally comparing apples to pears because the two schemes are so different. Um, one's international exchange, one's apple mobility. So I think time will tell. Yeah. And to sum it all up, I guess I could say that I'm seeing two main outcomes out of this very interesting uh, discussion. Thank you very much for it, Tina. The first one is that, first of all, we see how important Erasmus is. Even if the framework and a legal perspective gets out, the States, Britain, the United Kingdom immediately tries to find something because it's a very crucial aspect. And the second, which is a little bit perhaps more worrying about the United Kingdom, is that we're seeing this regional approach. We started with Erasmus would be safe. We ended up with more uh, students leaving from the United Kingdom towards Europe, than, towards Europe and them coming in. And now we're seeing... Wales having its own different program, Scotland having talks about a different program, England having its own touring scheme, and obviously as Leah described the situation in Northern Ireland being quite complicated. So I would only say that in light even of the referendum in Scotland in October of 2023, things are certainly going to get interesting. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for that fantastic conversation. Um on this sort of school to work transition. Right now we're going to move into a discussion uh, with Thomas and Sophia on red tape, the kind of domestic impact of Brexit on the labor force. Cool, thank you. So I just wanted to dive, dive right into the first question, which is more of a kind of general one, I'd say. Um, Thomas, how has Brexit affected UK labor's labor market and especially like young people? How is that? How has it changed? Like, is there anything in particular that we have seen currently that has been uh, the most like mostly affected? Uh, yeah, Sophia, thanks uh, for your question. So first, uh, what I would like to say is that I will answer your question in two parts. The first part is about the UK's labor market, and the second one is about uh, looking at young people specifically. So if we refer to the UK labor markets, we can see direct and indirect uh, consequences uh, of the Brexit, of Brexit. And when it comes to direct consequences, the first one would be like uh, the, the single market because the UK is not anymore in the EU's uh, single market and therefore there is no free movement of workers anymore. <clears throat> so secondly, uh, according to the economists, uh, it has also an economic impact because investment uh, would have been dragged down less than the, the, they will, uh, that it was the case during the pandemic uh, because of Brexit and loss of attractiveness of the UK to investors. And third, the, the third direct impact that we can see is the, the increase in living costs for uh, UK citizens uh, because uh, with Brexit, uh, commodity price, prices has increased around 3% on a sorry, uh, only in 2020 and 2021. Then when it comes to indirect consequences is uh, where the real influence of Brexit can really be seen. And here, what I think that I, I consider useful to, to mention is that the fact that we don't have any more EU funding. Gina has already discussed about it, has already mentioned it. 
but it's important that in the EU budget we have uh, cohesion policy funds and now also the RRF. Uh, and the one of the, the objectives of these uh, programs is to allocate money to poorest regions and they also place employment and social policies in, in the agenda of the EU. Uh, with this, uh, employment and social policies have also been effective in their, uh, affected in the UK indirectly because uh, we have in the EU the European pillar of social rights that doesn't apply to the UK because of Brexit. And yeah, now if I turn, if I turn to young workers in particular, this also applies that the, the fact that uh, there is a limited fund coming from the government also applies to them uh, because it's important to rebalance uh, inequalities and econ economic and social inequalities in, in the UK and within the EU that it's uh, not the case with the UK. Cool, thank you so much for your answer. So the second question I kind of have dives more deeply into um, kind of seasonal employment. And I think this relates a lot to what um, one comment which was made earlier on our LinkedIn account um, from Laura about kind of like getting visas to work um, as students or not as students in general, as young people. Um, so kind of like my question is like, how has Brexit affected like seasonal employment and particularly um, are there any kind of areas where it has been affected the most and like what has changed actually for you mm -hmm. um, as previously I feel like a lot of sorry and I feel like a lot of, a lot of you have you know uh, migrated just for the summer from the UK to EU from the EU to the UK and it's been uh, it's been I feel like a big part of our kind of like European uh then there it's that for you to like migrate during the summer so i feel like how how was that affected well, for sure seasonal work uh, has been affected by by brexit and in particular the fact that workers do not have free, uh, do not have free both uh, any rights anymore affect uh, these sectors but then if we look at the national sphere that we will see is that there is uh, a, a drop in labor supply also for for these sectors which is also affecting uh, workers that are or employees in these uh, uh, seasonal employment sectors. But uh, let me take a couple of examples. I will take the first one, which is a seasonal uh, economic sector, which is agriculture. In agriculture, around 90% of the total workers, of the seasonal workers, uh, are EU national, coming from the EU. So now we have this problem uh, of the of the visa that Regina already mentioned, because we have a new uh, point-based system for big visa applicants uh, for the rest of the world. And this uh, makes harder, even though not impossible, but it makes harder for workers since uh, has less skill to work in the UK. And then uh, I will take another example, which is medicine, uh, in which even if we are not talking about a seasonal uh, sector, economic sector, uh, the workforce, the workforce is the biggest concern. Uh, the new immigration rules uh, from January 2021 still allow the recruitment of our professional healthcare uh, staff in the in the UK coming from the EU, but it is more expressive and bureaucratic, which is the, the the title of our section, the red tape. And then it is easier to require to recruit uh, new people coming from outside the European Economic Area. Uh, then we have also the example of nurses where 9,000 nurses have been uh, higher coming from outside the European economic area. Perfect, thank you. And, and our last question would be regarding um, kind of the vulner vulnerability of workers in Britain. Specifically, you've mentioned the uh, pillar of social rights in Europe. And you know how that is like one part of uh, key European policies, and for example, like that does not uh, rely on uh, on UK currently. So how how has Brexit made workers more vulnerable in Britain? Um, how has that kind of changed, and what 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 has it how has it affected? Oh uh, well, uh, thanks for your question. So first, uh, vulnerability has been exacerbated by after Brexit. 
uh, by social risks, including also the marketization of higher, higher education in England and world, and then the imposition of labor and welfare reforms with high degrees of conditionality and fle flexible, sorry, flexible labor market conditions. Uh, another thing that I found interesting uh, when I was reading about Brexit is about uh, not only economically vulnerable, but also legal, legally uh, more vulnerable uh, employees. Because if we take the sample of, uh, of the right to strike uh, proposal coming from the uh, British government, uh, I, I don't want to, to deep dive into the, the reform because it's not the, the scope of this webinar. But if, if a citizen feels that the law goes against uh, their rights or his or her rights, they don't have any more the layer of protection or the remedy coming from the EU. All the articles uh, in the in article uh, the procedure in Article Seven on the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU or the Conditionality Regulation on the Rule of Law, and then uh, where what research shows is that the effectiveness. Uh, of the new mechanism on in this trade agreement that has also been mentioned before in, in this webinar, the effectiveness of the mechanism is low, lower and the enforcement is weaker. So citizens of the UK are unprotect not unprotected, but less protected. Brilliant. So I think um, in summary for, for, the, for this section, uh, there really is a genuine sense that there has been a loss in the kind of protection of rights to many workers to some extent as well, but also, um, you know, the ability for European workers to choose the UK has also diminished. Now, a few concluding remarks. Uh, we've seen hopefully throughout this webinar, uh, the impact that leaving the European Union has had uh, on young people in the UK. Uh, Gina has highlighted the school to work transition, uh, particularly the loss of opportunity for many people from uh, different sort of socioeconomic backgrounds the loss of Erasmus, for instance, um, and its replacement by perhaps a well-meaning yet very chaotic Turing scheme and somewhat underfunded Turing scheme uh, is definitely something that's worth underlining. The fact that it might not have any reciprocity uh, with other schemes is definitely also something worth underlining. And also the fact that it doesn't cater necessarily to um, you know, neat uh, young people, for instance, is again something that we would like to underline. Ultimately, Erasmus allows young people to move uh, across the EU, but also gain different skills, which is really crucial for people from disadvantaged backgrounds um, in gaining access um, to those skills first, uh, with, you know, for them to bring back to the UK. Uh, Tomas has outlined the, well, first off, the lack of attractiveness of the UK to investors, but I think that's, that is known um, outside of, you know, the sort of issues of young people, um, but also the lack of funding towards low income areas, which again, returns back to young people in those areas. Um, again, the idea of seasonal employment as being something that EU citizens could gain when they came to the to the UK and kind of get that exchange, that's disappeared, and that's had an impact on the agricultural sector and also on medicine. Finally, Tomas has also underlined the vulnerability of workers in Britain uh, following um, this this rift. So ultimately, um, there are some short term concerns with Brexit to do with employment um, and you know the employment of young people, but ultimately there is probably more of a latent issue. Uh, which is to do with the vulnerability of young workers and the loss of opportunity for young workers. Hopefully this webinar has highlighted the role that the EU plays in protecting uh, these workers, providing opportunity, uh, and the role that the UK now has to take over. You can find out more about the Youth Employment uh, Working Group's work on the EST website, on its LinkedIn page, uh, as well as, as on Instagram and on Twitter. Do also look out for the work that we'll be doing at the European Youth Event in 2023, uh, in June, uh, it's a workshop on the discussion well, and a discussion on rights in the workplace across the EU and the abuse of those rights we'll be doing in collaboration with the Human Rights Working Group at the EST. Thank you for listening. <laughs>